In this video, I'm going to show to you why everything Bassem Yusuf has to say is either a complete lie or a distorted way of looking at the reality. If you remember, Bassem Yusuf, the Egyptian comedian, the handsome, charming guy, had two interviews with Piers Morgan. The first got over 20 million views in less than two weeks, which led to the second interview that got over 10 million views in less than a week. I'm not going to say that the facts that he presents are complete lie because some of the facts are correct, but the way he put them in the bigger context is complete nonsense. The first argument is about proportionality. The, the thing is, the question is, what is a proportionate response? Because yes. it has been different from one tier to another. So if you look to this graph, for example, this is the death of Israeli and Palestinians, and it's changing from one year to year. It's like fluctuating like crypto. What is the proportionate between Israeli death and Palestinian death? But let's see what proportionality actually means in the international law. And that it seems to be is that there are not enough Jews uh, who have died to justify Israel's response uh, according to uh, this conception of proportionality. Um, Matthew, that is not only morally reprehensible, but also legally illiterate. Proportionality in international law is not comparing casualty figures. Uh, under international humanitarian law, the principle of proportionality uh, forbids attacks in which expected civilian casualties will be excessive in relation to the anticipated military advantage gained. Very, very different from what Bassem has to say. The second argument is very important, and I think that in this argument, Bassem has a point. Before I'm going to address the argument, let's hear it from Bassem's words. I watched the news and, I, and there was a lot of um, protest that was led by Jewish Voice for Peace. And they were led by people who opposed the Israeli attack on the civilians. And I remember quite well, many of the Republican representatives in Congress came out and they were calling these the global intifada, the global jihad. I love it when they say jihad. They sound like a horse, jihad, it's <laughs> very funny. Uh, or, they, or they say like, these are, and I quote, Iranian-backed jihadists. Mm -hmm. And I said, wait a minute, but most of those people are Jewish. Those people who took over the capital, the same people who took over Central Station in New York, which is known as the biggest civil disobedience event in America in the last two decades, they were all Jewish. And then I find Nikki Haley saying anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism. The only Basim Yusuf can take the word jihad and make it sound funny. Jihad! If you're anti semite you probably anti-Zionism. Because the whole concept of Zionism is to give the Jewish people any piece of land. Okay? This is the whole concept of Zionism from the Gentile point of view. But if you anti the Israeli government, this means nothing about whether you are anti-Zionism or anti-Semite. Many people in the Israeli in the Israeli public are against the Israeli government, okay? In the Israeli elections, we don't get 70, 80 percent for one party and only 20 percent for another party. We get approximately 55, 45, which means that approximately half the population in Israel are against the Israeli government. But if you are a Gentile, if you are not a Jew, and you are outside Israel, and you said, I'm anti-Zionist, this is de facto means that you are anti the idea that the Jewish people can get a state. And this is exactly what people in uh, university campuses shouting all day long, from the river to the sea. One thing that they don't know which river and what sea, but this is another story. The idea that if you want a Palestinian state from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, it means de facto a Juden Rhine state, a state without Jews. This is what happened with Hamas in Gaza Strip, and this is exactly what happens with Mahmoud Abbas in the West Bank. The idea of from the river to the sea de facto says this is a Juden Rhine state. So if you said I'm anti Zionist, 
but I'm not anti-Semite, you basically lie. שלוש, שתיים. So again, we have anti-Jew, which is anti-Semite, we have anti-Zionism, and we have anti the government of Israel. I want to uh, elaborate on anti-Zionism because we saw ultra-Orthodox Jew people in the streets of New York City march and protest pro-Hamas and against the government of Israel. So let me recap. We have anti-Jew, which is basically anti-Semite. We have anti-Zionism and we have anti-Israeli government. Now again, I think that anti-Israeli government mean means that basically what we have in Israel is pluralism. Israel is a liberal country and we have a range of opinions ranging from the far left to the far right. We have people in Israel right now against the Israeli government. We have people in Israel right now pro the Palestinian civilians. And let me ask you Basem, I don't see against Hamas or pro Israeli people in the Gaza Strip or in the West Bank. The idea that Israeli people can disagree about such a fundamental subject means a very good state of power. We can tolerate many different opinions. Let's move on to another argument. Okay? In this argument, Basem tells a horrific story and I want to address each and every bit of the story. Hate. And again, this is another way why this has been magnified in the media so much. What does the Western audience see? They see people rejoicing for the death of innocent civilians in Israel. This is what have the Arabs seen for years in, 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 on the Arab. You know, when I first heard that he says, this is what the Arabs seen for years, I said, what? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Do Israeli people, do the Israeli people, do the Jewish people rejoice when innocent civilians are being butchered and slaughtered and raped and burned alive? And this is what his perspective on how the Arabs seen this entire scenario from their perspective for, for years. For example, if you look up Sidrot Cinema, this is in 2014 when Israel was bombing Gaza as usual and the Israelis in the Sidrot, uh, uh, the kibbutz or the, the settlement, they, were sit, they went on a hill and they had popcorn and they had drinks and they were like watching the show and they were cheering with every rocket coming down. This is what we see. Now, I didn't know anything about Sidrot cinema, so I went out, uh, online and checked. What I found was completely different than the story Bassem tries to convey. The idea is, and I'm going into details shortly, that it was a singular event once in a decade and it was conducted as praising the... Defense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't know what the cinema means, so I went online and checked. And what I found was completely different than the story Bassem tries to convey. First, it was 10 years ago, a singular event, and it was conducted to praise the Israeli self-defense Iron Dome. Let me go into details. In 2014, three boys were kidnapped by Hamas from Israel. This led to a massive operation in the Gaza Strip. Again, what initiated the entire thing was that Hamas kidnapped and murdered three innocent boys. Okay? Slerot is not a settlement and not a kibbutz, it's a city in the south of Israel. And since Slerot is very close to the border with Gaza, many years Slerot is suffering from missiles shooting at it. Okay? Over and over again. In 2014, this was the launch of the Israeli Iron Dome. Iron Dome, the system that going to shoot back at missiles coming from Gaza. And yes, there were some people going to a hill in Sderot and watching the Iron Dome, okay? If you want to see the actual footage 
from the Sderot cinema, it is, you can see it here. Okay, this is Sderot cinema. Again, a singular event once in a decade. And people in the Israeli media at that time, and now I remember, said, mm, you know, I totally understand you, the people of Sderot that are suffering year after year after year for missiles coming from Gaza. And for the first time, all you want to do is to just watch them getting that back. But again, people in the Israeli media said you shouldn't do it. On the contrary, in Palestine, in the Gaza Strip, if you have a terror attack, and it's not just a terror attack on Israel, you know, September 11, many other terror attacks, okay? People in the Gaza Strip, in the West Bank, in Palestine, celebrate it, celebrate it with candies. They bring candies and say, oh, we had 9-11, over 2,000 people, 200, 2,000 American civilians were killed. Let's celebrate. This is completely different from the story Bassem tries to convey. And again, Bassem right now is an American citizen. Okay? He's not an Egyptian. He's not a Palestinian. Right now he's an American citizen. So he can play in both fields. Let's move on to his second example. Google the wedding of hate. Hmm. This is like an, a Jewish wedding in Israel where they were celebrating the arsons and no, the no, burning seen, of, seen, of Palestinians. No, but no, I, 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 to I'm, be clear, I've seen lots of no, videos. No, no, but I'm not, not talking to you. And again, the wedding of hate is totally uh, right about the wedding of hate. If you Google the wedding of hate, you will see uh, what he describes. But again, the Israeli public condemned the wedding of hate. I think people went to jail because of this wedding of hate. And let me just be precise. The wedding of hate was a wedding ceremony that throughout or during the dance festival, people were like uh, with their guns and say anti-Palestinian things. But again, we see those kinds of acts in every Palestinian wedding ceremony, either in the West Bank or in Gaza. We again, he compares the margin of society, of the Israeli society, with the majority of the Palestinian society. In Israel, we condemn those margins, and sometimes we send them to jail. But again, in Palestine, both in Gaza Strip and in the West Bank, this is the majority. Most of the people tweet or act like this. Not only this, but the elite of the Israeli society are the students. Again, th those are the elite of every society. And the elite of the Palestinian society are the students who conducted the massacre in Ramallah. Why? Because in the Palestinian public, in the Palestinian society, the more articulated, the more educated you are, the more extremist, the more violent. This is a fundamental difference between the Israeli and the Palestinian society. Which brings me back to this well-spoken, charming man, Bassem Yusuf. In this video, or in this segment of the video, and I must say, he did his homework flawlessly. He speaks about the First Crusade, and he first about, and he talks about many things in the Jewish history. But the way he frames everything is basically Israel is a colonialism project conducted by the European. And again, in all the post-colonialism uh, faculties in North America and in Europe, those things resonate so much, which took many students outside to protest pro-Hamas, while the bodies of the Jewish people in Kibbutz Berberi were still warm. Let's see, or let's hear what Bassem has to say and how Bassem frame the birth of the uh, modern state of Israel. A solution. A solution for what? For the Jewish problem. So that we need to get rid of them. And you know what? Palestine was not even on the, on the A list. Palestine on the, was on the B list. Because England proposed 6,000 square miles in Uganda for the Jews, 1903. And the reason why Palestine was not on the list, that it was objected by a lot of rabbis that said, like, it's a promised land, but only when the Messiah comes. Now, I must say, he's completely right, but he's not right in one very important thing. Palestine was option number one. And then, 
after people say, you know, maybe Uganda he frames everything like we just needed a place. We just needed a place to put the Jews. But it's not the case. Palestine, or again, Palestine is the is a derogatory name that the Roman Empire gave the state of Judea, okay? Palestine is, is the state of Israel, and Jews went back in the, uh, the horizon of, nation, of nationalism in the 19th century. They went back and they wanted to come back to the state of Israel, the state that they had on their praise, and the state that they yearn for 2,000 years. So yes, we had Uganda on the, on the table, on the list. And yes, we had Madagascar. But people in, uh, in the Congress, in the Zionist Congress, objected and, 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 and didn't want even to hear about it. And this is not me speaking. This is Herzl, you know, the founder of the Zionism movement, says, why not Uganda? This is extremely important. Let's move on to another thing that he has to say. Uh, there were other options, Argentina, South Africa, Uganda, Madagascar. And eventually, they said, all right, let's do Palestine. So they went to Palestine in 1914. There were 700,000 people living in Palestine, 3% were Jewish. Now, I'm not going even to discuss the numbers. I don't think that those numbers are correct, you know. Uh, 700,000 people, only 3% were Jewish. I don't think those numbers are correct. But nevertheless, I want to stress two things. One, and this is very important, uh, this is not a European project. He frames everything like, you know, all the European Jews came to Israel. But it's not just the European Jews. We have Jews from Africa. We have Jews from Asia. We have many other Jews. This is not a European colonialism project. This is a uh, point number one. And point number two is that history or the history of the modern state of Israel doesn't start at 1914. It started much earlier. The first aliyah, the first massive immigration from abroad to the state of Israel or to, to the place of Israel w is what we call the first aliyah was conducted in 1882. And we should inspect and figure out how many Muslims and how many Christians were in Israel before this period. It is absolutely true that in 1914, 1920, there were many Muslims, even more Muslims than Jews. We, we have no disagreement about that. But all of those Arabs came because of the nationalism awakening in Europe and in other parts that brought Jews into the state of Israel before there was a state of Israel. And they searched or they seeked for a job. Okay, Without the Jews in the place of Israel, there will be no Arabs whatsoever. Now, I know that there was, were Arab settlements in Israel prior to the 19th century, but there were, were, were also Jewish and Christian settlements. If you read Mark Twain, the legendary author, he went to the Holy Land in just before the first Aliyah, and he says in his memorials, there are no people in Israel. Even the olive tree, which the state of Israel is known for, even the olive tree is rarely seen. Okay? This is very important. Let's move on to another argument by Bassam. Okay? Let's move on to see to 1948, the declaration of the independence of the state of Israel. Of the state of Israel, there were 2 million people living there. Only 30% of them was Jews. So the whole idea of like a land without a people to a people without a land was a marketing thing. They were already Palestinians. So suddenly, from our perspective, the Jewish problem is not a Jewish problem, is not a Middle Eastern problem, is not an Arab problem, it is a European problem. No, it's not a European problem, and again, those are the Jews of Morocco and the Jews of Yemen and the Jews of Ethiopia. This is one thing. And this is very important to say. There were Arabs. The land of Israel was belonged to Muslims in the 7th century. Okay? 
in the seventh century, the land of Israel was belonged to Muslims. But, and this is crucial to understand, the Palestinians that, has, that have claims on the state of Israel right now have nothing to do with the Muslim like uh, 1400 years ago, okay? No connection whatsoever. And Basim presented it like, you know, this was our land from days before, and we just incorporated and wanted to give some part to the Jews. No, there wasn't a Palestinian government in this period of time. By the way, the Prime Minister, Golda Meir, said one, one said, I'm a Palestinian. I carry a Palestinian passport. What do you mean by Palestinians? We have Palestinians Jews and we have Palestinians Arabs. It was pushed on us together with the guilt because now we are the anti-Semite. We are, now we are the Jewish hater. And not just that, they took land. So people look at this like, why are we even, we, we had a lot of refugees coming in. And no, we didn't have a lot of refugees. And again, I'm not sure what Basim means when he says we. If he means we, the Palestinian people, you didn't want any refugees in the state of Israel. This is very important. Okay, how do I know it? Because when the United Nations said, okay, let's take two states, one for Israel and one for the Palestinians, the Palestinians said no. And in the same day that Israel declared the independence, they went on war to destroy and kill and butcher each and every one of Israel's civilians. If by we, Basa means the Palestinian people, they never had a government, they never had a currency, they never had a king, they never had a, a famous poet, they had nothing with regard to a state or a sovereignty in Israel. Basa moves on with many more lies and I'm not going to cover every one of them in this video. If you want, please say in the comments below that you want part two. I just want to address two more things. One is how Bassem uh, presents the terror organization, Fatah. You know the Fatah movement, which is the PLO, of the course, Fatah. This was their uh, slogan. Can you see? You see there's a crescent, a cross, and a menorah. And they say unitary, democratic, non-sectarian. So basically in the 1960s, Fatah were basically marijuana smoking tree hugger hippies. The slogan that he says was created by an Australian uh, guy in 1979 in Australia. And Fatah was not a, a marijuana smoking tree hugger hippies. No, they were a terror organization and they conducted many acts of terror throughout uh, the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Another uh, thing that I want to uh, address is what Bassem says when Pierce Morgan asks, wait a minute, what about Egypt? What about Jordan? Pierce doesn't say it specifically, but you know, if Gaza is the biggest prison on life, on, on earth, Israel has only one gate to this prison. Egypt has the second gate and Jordan, not in Gaza, but in the West Bank, has third gate. Why does Jordan not open the gates to the Palestinian people? After all, 70% of the civilians in Jordan are Palestinians. Why Egypt doesn't open the gate to the Palestinian? After all, Egypt used to rule Gaza. And this is what Bassem has to say about this very question. want to constantly attack Israel without actually offering any place to go for the Palestinians. So what do you say to that? That is exactly what Israel wants. And that is exactly what might actually starts Third War III. This is the war solution. These are Palestinians, these are their lands. Mm. And then suddenly take them, why? So they've been basically kicked around from their homes. And now another country should take them? You see what will happen? Imagine this. Mm. Now, and because Israeli official has been talking openly about this. Mm. It's like, why don't they just go in Sinai? Why they go? Mm. You know what would happen? Those people are gonna be pushed in Sinai and with any population, two million people, 
They are living in refugee camp. What do you think will happen? Unrest, mm. uh, uh, chaos. Mm. And then after a few years, the Western media will come with their cameras like, oh, look at those Arabs. Oh, they're killing each other. Oh, Israel is good that they got rid of them. And then they will go to the West Bank. And suddenly those 3.5 million people push into Jordan. This, the whole idea, why does Jordan take them? Why does Egypt take them? The same question. You, Europe has 44 countries. Why don't they take Israel? Mm. America has 50 states. Why don't they give them Florida? I mean, they, we seem to complain about Florida the whole time. Why do Okay, I have so many things to say. First, <laughs> let's talk. One, uh, <laughs> wow, amazing. Okay, let's start. Uh, Bassem knows that there is no way on earth that if the Palestinians go to Jordan or Egypt, they will assimilate and become more productive and start a new life. He knows for sure that the only possible outcome of people going to Egypt to their fellow Muslim friends will just cause chaos and open a third world war. By the way, let me tell you, Bassam, no one cares about the Palestinians besides Israel. Israel is the only player in this uh, region that actually care about Palestinians. This is one. The second, and this is not me, this is Douglas Mary point, no one care about Muslims. No one care about Muslim killing it one each other. We had many hundreds of thousand people dead in Syria. We had many Muslim dead in Yemen. We have the Chinese government slaughtered uh, Muslim people, but no one cares. The only thing or the only reason why people care so much about the Palestinians is the state of Israel. Now, I want to go over a second argument in what Bassem says. What Bassem says is, you know what happens if you don't take my advice? You, don't what, you, you know what will happen if you don't give the Palestinian people what they want? They will start a third world war. And this, everything that you have to say, the only way Palestinian, Palestinians has achieved anything throughout their history is by threatening and by violence and by murder. And it's not me saying it. You know, the other day, the second most important person in Hamas, in Gaza Strip, said exactly the same thing. We didn't start a war because we wanted fuel. We are not here to run Gaza to supply water or electricity. We are here because we want chaos. We want everyone in this region to be non-calm, to be uh, in a permanent state of war. And then Bassem says, you know, why don't you send the Jews back to Florida? Again, it's not the Israeli, it's the Jews, because it's not about Israeli or, or non-Israeli, it's about the Jews versus the Muslims. But Bassem well knows that if the Jews go back, okay, if the Jews go back, they will assimilate just like they did in the last 2,000 years, and they will prosper. Why do you think the Muslim or the Palestinian world is so furious about Israel? Because according to the Quran, Muhammad was the last prophet. The Quran is a book of God. You need nothing else but the Quran. And the Muslim people are the chosen people. And we need to condemn Israel, you know why? Because it didn't accept Muhammad as the final prophet. But if, if this is the case, how come every Muslim country on earth is so poor besides the oil? How come Israel that has no oil and they had two million refugees in 1948 managed to prosper, to succeed and to uh, define itself without the need of the Palestinians. There is no positive definition to the self-identity of a Palestinian beside being against Israel. If, just for a thought experiment, if, just a thought experiment, the Palestinian people will vanish, the state of Israel, the state of Egypt, even the state of Jordan will continue to thrive to prosper and to do their own things. If the state of Israel 
will vanish. There will be no Palestinian state. You know why? Because the only thing, the only thing that unite, that glue together those two million people are the hate to the state of Israel. And again, this is not Israel versus the Arabs. 20% of the population of Israel are Arabs. Again, let me say it again. 20% of the population of Israel are Muslim Arabs. Okay? This is a shocking fact to digest. And we supply Gaza with water, electricity. Yes, it is very hard to supply water, electricity, and internet when they're bombing at your missiles and slaughtering your babies. And no other state in the history of mankind has ever, ever supplied so many things, so many vital things during a state of war. At the beginning of the interview, of the second interview, Basim Yusuf says, I am the least qualified man to discuss the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And I beg to differ. Basim Yusuf is the most qualified man to discuss this issue. Why? Because the Palestinian narrative and the Palestinians' arguments in this conflict are full with holes, just like a fishnet. And the only way to go through them to, is to distract away from the flows, from the holes. And there is no man, there is no one like Basim Yusuf with his charming smile and his blue eyes to do this precise job. Luckily, to answer Basim Yusuf's arguments, you don't need to be beautiful and even an Israeli guy with a, bl a black hair and thick accent can do it. If you want part two, please say in the comments below. My name is Roy Yozovich. Thank you so much for your time.